Welcome back to my series where I look into the Netflix show Ancient Apocalypse to figure out what is fact and what is fiction. My name is Kaylee and this is my response to episode 2 of the show. The episode is called Survivor in a Time of Chaos. And if you haven't watched my response to episode 1, There Once Was a Flood, please click the card in the upper right corner or the first link in the description down below. So let's jump right in, shall we? The episode starts with Graham wondering if we are a species with amnesia, and that archaeologists hate him for trying to find out if we as a species forgotten a vital part of our own story. I don't think that archaeologists hate him. And, you know, definitely not for the reason that he gives the viewer here. Archaeologists dislike his assumptions and his theories, especially because they aren't based on any factual evidence. So he thinks, and I quote here, that the notion of a lost advanced civilization of the Ice Age is extremely threatening to mainstream archaeology because it rips the ground out from under that entire discipline. This, to me personally, sounds strange because I have yet to meet an archaeologist that wouldn't love to find evidence to such an idea. It would be groundbreaking. It would completely rewrite our own current known history. It would make the person finding the evidence the most important individual in that field for an extremely long time to come. Who wouldn't want that fame and glory? to make their parents proud and for all the other reasons that you can think of, they can win prizes and everything. Who wouldn't want that? So I think it's a strange thing to say. Of course we know that exceptional claims like the ones that Graham Hancock brings forth in his show would need exceptional evidence. So in the beginning of this episode we see Joe Rogan. I used to watch his podcast on YouTube for quite a long time. I grew up with him presenting Fear Factor. I like Joe Rogan. He's a very charismatic person, but he's not a scientist. He doesn't work in the field of science, and he doesn't know much about archaeological research or anthropological research. While he might have a very positive opinion about Graham Hancock and his work, that is all he can give us, his opinion. And his opinion is based on his perception and not rooted in factual evidence. Graham Hancock then says that there are no documents of the past, of the Ice Age, and that we have to build our picture of the past from fragmentary evidence. In his perception, folk stories, legends and myths should be viewed as important pieces of evidence. So on this bit, I would say yes and no. Yes, we built the picture from our past, from the evidence that we gather, and as more evidence is uncovered, the more that picture develops and evolves. So myths, legends and folk tales aren't archaeological evidence and they aren't considered in the archaeological research. We all know the phone game when you need to listen to a short story and then tell the next person that same short story. And within 10 people, the story completely changes. And that's what happens with folk tales and myths and legends that have been going around for like, what, hundreds, maybe thousands of years? We also need to take into account that these folk tales, these myths and these legends are usually embellished. Of course, we need to look at all evidence, but we also need to not cherry pick evidence that hints at this theory that he's proposing being right, which I personally feel like he has been doing in his books and his TV appearances and podcast appearances and this show. He says that one of the most mysterious and revealing mythologies in prehistory comes down to us through the ancient cultures of Mexico. He travels to the Puebla region in Mexico to visit Cholula, the oldest continuously inhabited city in the region. When the Spanish conquistadors arrived in 1519, they massacred the inhabitants, which obliterated not only their culture, but also almost all traces of more ancient cultures that had preceded them. Which, you know, is a shame. Damn you, Spanish. He says that the invaders couldn't erase everything and they built a church on what they assumed was just a hill. But, you know, it's not just a hill. This is actually the most massive monument ever built anywhere in the world. And yeah, this is indeed the largest pyramid by volume in the world. What I do like about this series that he's made on Netflix are the possible ways that these monuments would have looked like in their prime. 
the 3D render for the Great Pyramid of Cholula was mesmerizing to see. The visual team definitely did a great job here. But the measurements that Graham gives us of the pyramid are, you know, a bit puzzling to me. He says that the pyramid would have had a height of 65 meters, which is 213 feet, and that the base would have measured 400 by 400 meters, which is 1312 by 1312 feet. I have used more than a dozen different sources to find the measurements of the Great Pyramid of Cholula, and they range between 54 to 66 meters in height, which is 177 to 217 feet in height, and the measurements of the base of the pyramid range between 300 by 400 meters wide. Um, that's 984 to 1476 feet wide. Nowhere was I able to find the exact measurements. I understand that it's very hard to know the size of the base for such uh, a structure, for sure, because, you know, a massive amount of this pyramid has been underground for so long, and it's not easy to find the exact points and everything, and measure it perfectly. It's just difficult. So he's very sure of his measurements. Um, I can't say for sure that he's right or that he's wrong. We then meet Jeff McCafferty, an archaeologist and anthropologist from the University of Calgary, one of the leading experts on the Great Pyramid of Cholula. He tells us that Mexican archaeologists have excavated the tunnels in the pyramid and that these tunnels measure eight kilometers long, which honestly is absolutely extraordinary. Cholula is a pyramid with multiple pyramids inside. It was a continuous build which started around 500 BCE. Over time, this first pyramid was expanded by numerous generations over a span of 1700 years until it reached the sheer size that we see today, which is absolutely enormous. Graham Hancock says that archaeologists know next to nothing about the original architects and why they chose to build a pyramid here. Jeffrey McCafferty tells Graham that the first pyramid was built over an important spring. The spring represents a passageway into the underworld, which means that this was clearly an important and sacred space with a ceremonial focus. So Graham Hancock believes that the spring underneath the oldest pyramid structure at Cholula is a critical clue to understand the motivations of the original builders. Because he says that it's a repeating theme that we find all over the world. He then refers to Gunung Padang in Indonesia as being a similar terraced pyramid. Even though, and I honestly think everyone can agree with this, Gunung Padang is not even pyramid shaped. So how can you call it a pyramid? It's a hill structure, it's more like a mound than a pyramid, if I'm gonna be honest. So he says that the pattern of a sacred spring at the heart of a pyramid is found not just in Mexico or Indonesia, but also at the subterranean chamber of the Great Pyramid of Giza. And the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan in Mexico is situated on top of a natural cavern as well. So archaeologists believe that the subterranean chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza was most likely the original planned burial chamber for Khufu. It was probably abandoned after they started creating the King's Chamber as the burial chamber. But it is believed by archaeologists that the spring underneath the Great Pyramid of Giza was dug by the workers and not actually already present in the same way that the spring was already existing before construction began at the Great Pyramid of Cholula. So Graham then says that he thinks it's a mystery that the builders of the Cholula Pyramid and the Kufa Pyramid have so much in common because the Cholula Pyramid is oriented to the setting sun, while the Great Pyramid of Giza is oriented to true astronomical north. I honestly don't think it's a mystery. When these civilizations lived, there wasn't much light pollution. Actually, nearly none. So, and you know, especially compared to modern times. Ancient cultures used the stars in the sky to track time, to understand when to harvest, when to plant crops, when the shortest day of the year was, when the longest day of the year was, directions where they were traveling, and so much more. 
From all over the world, these ancient people who had no contact with each other all watched the same stars in the sky. And when we have different people from different backgrounds looking at the same stars, they will start to create similar structures and similar ways because they will see similar patterns. So these pyramid builders from around the world had the same source of inspiration, the stars in the night sky. So to me personally, this actually erases the mystery part that Graham refers to at 1237 in episode 2. He doesn't believe that it's a coincidence, and he also doesn't believe that the pyramid shape was the easiest way to make a high building. But, as an ex-construction student with a focus on architecture, I can safely say without a doubt that the pyramid shape is the easiest by far when you want to build high. The reason for this is because the weight is distributed equally. The top weight is supported and carried equally all the way down to the base with the least chance of the structure collapsing. He says that the problem with that reasoning is that these structures are universally associated with very specific spiritual ideas. What happens to us after death? But I have honestly yet to come across one person who hasn't asked themselves that question at least once or twice in their entire life. It is the biggest question that we as a species have, and I definitely don't find that a mystery. All humans wonder what will happen to us when life on this earth ends for us. And of course, ancient civilizations did this as well. They were not as different from us than, you know, some might think. Graham says that the spiritual idea is always connected with pyramid structures, but we see this with henges, dolmens and other temple structures as well, so I find that statement a bit strange. Maybe I am taking that in a wrong way, maybe I didn't understand him correctly, but I think it's still strange. He thinks that all pyramids on the globe are connected to some extraordinary master plan, a shared legacy from a lost global civilization that provided the seeds and the spark of inspiration from which many later civilizations grew. So there is a myth surrounding the Pyramid of Cholula that says that it was built by a race of giants. And Graham says that archaeologists ignore this origin tale completely. But Graham then proposes that this race of giants was not a race of physical giants, but intellectual giants from a lost advanced civilization. A race smarter than the native people of Mexico living at the time of the construction of the pyramid. And this is what brought up a whole lot of fuss online. This is where the debate around this show has heated up, because in a way he actually says that the native people living at the time weren't intellectual and capable enough of creating the immense structure of Cholula, but it had to be built by a different, smarter race. While he might not want to make it sound as bad as this does, unfortunately, it does sound as bad as it does. And the story of this myth also originates from the time of the Christian colonizers, which makes this myth not native to the land and heavily influenced by the Christian invaders, who of course had an agenda of their own as they saw themselves as superior to the native people. According to Graham Hancock, the site known as Texcoatzingo was created to honor the rain god Tlaloc, whose cult long predated the Aztecs, although the Aztecs did worship this god as well. Archaeologists date this site of Texcoatzingo somewhere in the 1400s, as it was designed by Nezahualcoyotl, who was the ruler of Texcoco around that time. But Graham wonders if Texcoatzingo could be much older, that the Aztecs merely renovated and added to the site. So he then brings on author Marco Figato, who wrote the book The Empires of Atlantis, a book that's not very well known, but filled with unoriginal ideas, with the mythical Atlantis and a theosophical set of races being the source of all modern populations. 
The book has actually been deemed quite racist. Sorry. Marco then states that the site has been clearly reworked over a very long period of time because the rock was a very hard type of porphyry stone. Saying the stone was a very hard type of porphyry stone is very broad, very broad, as this name was given to any igneous rock with large crystals, like for instance, uh, quartz, scattered in a very fine-grained matrix of smaller crystals. Porphyry stone has a typical hardness of seven on the most scale of mineral hardness, which makes it similar in hardness to steel and quartz. Marco then says that some of the stone surfaces at the site are very heavily weathered and that some parts of the site has clear evidence of erosion that in his perception must have taken thousands of years. He then again says that it's an extremely hard type of stone. But nowhere did I find anything relating to the stone here being exceptionally hard besides his claims. A seven on the Mohs scale is quite hard, yes, but definitely not extremely hard. It's actually the same hardness as granite. And we know that the ancient people loved working with granite and were definitely capable of shaping granite in their preferred way. Graham and Marco then agree that the Aztecs found the site when it had already been worked on, took it over and reworked it, which is then called a radical thought. There's no evidence to support their idea. They just theorized it one moment and then the next moment they accept it as fact. And that's not how archaeology and science works. So megaliths that lay on the ground on the site are then pointed as being evidence of this radical thought. Although honestly, these megaliths could have been from much earlier cultures brought to the site because of things like their age or the fact that they may have come from other older sacred sites. It wouldn't be the first time that something like that occurs. According to Graham, there's relevant evidence to make people consider their claim. A find of a massive statue of Tlaloc was uncovered in a riverbed of a mountain nearby. This is actually the largest single cut stone in the entire Americas, dating to around 700 CE long before the Aztecs started dominating these lands. But also long after the Olmecs had already dominated these lands. I was able to actually find that the Olmecs made Tlaloc masks between 1200 and 900 BCE, so they worshipped this god as well, and it doesn't point to an even older, lost civilization. So the statue of Tlaloc could actually have been made by the Olmecs, or any of the other cultures living in the area around that time, as they would usually take on worshipping each other's gods as their cultures merged, for instance. Like after battle or war or due to trades and all that stuff. Good reasons. Graham then shifts his focus to the god Quetzalcoatl, the god who after the Great Flood taught the people in the region everything. And with everything, I mean everything from how to grow crops and domesticate animals to laws and taught them the ways of architecture, astronomy, and the arts. Quetzalcoatl was worshipped as a deity, but another war god apparently outed him and made him sail away to the east with the promise that he would one day return. Graham says the setting is always the same. There's a giant cataclysm with the world being plunged into darkness, floods, and chaos everywhere, um, society collapsing, and then, you know, one figure appears out of this darkness with the knowledge of what is needed to create a civilization. So he goes on to say that archaeologists are of the opinion that these civilizing heroes are just inventions of the ancient cultures, elaborate fictions, and, you know, that stuff. He finds the similarities between the different cultures hard to ignore, although I honestly have to say I don't agree with him here. While these tales have some similarities, they are different in quite a bit of ways. He thinks that these accounts from these cultures describe the survivors of an advanced civilization that was lost in the great cataclysms of flood and fire that occurred near the end of the last ice age. Marco believes that there is a record of Quetzalcoatl being a survivor of an ancient advanced lost civilization in what is left of the city Chochicalco, which was built around 700 CE. I honestly wonder, and this is my personal thoughts, this is the way I perceive this, what did the people from this lost advanced civilization do from 9600 BCE until 700 CE? Did it really take them nearly 9000 years to get to Mexico? 
I honestly find this extremely hard to believe. Xochicalco may have a temple dedicated to the god Quetzalcoatl, but this was probably built around 650 CE. Marco reads the glyphs on the temple and says that it's a depiction of a cataclysm happening around a temple and the god Quetzalcoatl on a raft going away from the temple when this cataclysm happened. Graham then says that this particular interpretation of the wall of an ancient apocalypse flies in the face of all archaeological opinion. And even though the temple is only about 1350 years old, he thinks that the archaeologists are missing the point of the myth. Because the myth surrounding Quetzalcoatl predates the construction of the temple. He wonders if the legend of Quetzalcoatl's arrival could date as far back as 12,800 years ago. He then says that sadly in the world of archaeology, the archaeology of ideas is lacking, that they focus too much on the dates of a structure and not enough on the ideas that a structure is expressing. What he forgets here is that archaeology isn't based on ideas, it is based on science. We find something, we research it, we date it, and then we try and fit that thing into the known timeline. If it's older, we need to shift the timeline back. If it's out of place, we need to try and figure out how it got there. Or realize that we have a gap in our understanding of the history of a place or a culture. The ideas that archaeologists bring forth are only brought up after the research is done, not before, and definitely not at the hands of a folktale. Archaeologists definitely look at what a structure may be expressing through its depictions and the found artifacts in or near it. We know this. We see this at Newgrange in Ireland, for instance. Graham is of the belief that archaeologists have set an artificial horizon in our history and that if we look past that created horizon, the myths of cataclysm start to make sense as a true record of a lost and forgotten past. But, and here I have to intervene, I'm sorry, archaeologists do not create this so-called artificial horizon. We constantly push back the timeline when we discover older things. But if we haven't discovered older things, we cannot push back that timeline that far. While I understand where he's coming from, his perception of archaeologists is of course skewed due to the fact that he is treated as a pseudo-archaeologist by them after, you know, writing his books and everything that he's been through, and then he looks at people like Sahi Hawaz in Egypt, and not everyone is a fan of Sahi Hawaz, let's be honest, but all archaeologists aren't like that. I do, however, feel like most of this Netflix show is him painting a bad picture of archaeologists, the people in the field that are actually working hard to broaden our understanding about the ancient world. That's how I view it. What do you think? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos, and click that bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I upload. If you haven't seen my previous videos yet, then click the card in the upper right corner or click one of the links in the description down below that goes straight to my playlist. And you can also click a video in the end card. Um, I have two playlists and the normal video is like set to best for viewers so youtube caters to you and what it is that you'd like to see and what you're already interested in um i would also like to say a massive thank you to all my patrons my channel members the people supporting me um thank you so much i know i don't post enough on patreon and i don't post enough here for the channel members and i'm very very sorry it's been a bit difficult lately um this baby here this lady she's very nice to me but after the death of her father earlier uh, in September, um, she hasn't been doing well and she's very lonely and she's actually taking it out on my boyfriend, which is not fun for him. So we might have to find her a small male companion so that she won't be this lonely anymore. But it's taking a lot of my time to try and make her as happy as possible in the meantime.
She's actually the reason why I'm not doing much besides one video a week right now, because she needs all my attention whenever she can. Thank you. Still love you. But yeah, um, this was episode two. And next week I'll definitely be back with episode three, Fact or Fiction, you know? Let's continue this and hopefully next week I'll be back with another video as well. More like anthropology or maybe I look into a structure. I don't know yet. Maybe you have an idea of what it is that you'd like to see. Let me know in the comments down below and I'll see you next time. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.